sweet. Tell us what, what group they're moving into. They're moving into the, uh, the middle school. Middle school. All right. Give her a hand, y'all. Wow. And then we have Aubrey Cook. What group is Aubrey moving into? Middle school. Middle school. Oh, my gosh. Go. Aubrey, where are you? Is that all we have? Is that all the ones we have? Yes, Here, sir. you just have. And Chris Mohammed added three. It's awesome. Both of you didn't see it, but over in that little corner there, we were both in tears because little first graders. Raising their hands wow. And praising God. Awesome. Wow. That's so awesome. And that's because you guys are teaching and training them. Isn't that awesome, y'all? Let's give them a hand again. They're going to go upstairs and have fun. They're going to go upstairs and have fun. Today is our Sunday fun day. If you don't know about that, last Sunday of every month, we, we just let them go have fun. And we've got some folks that uh, don't always teach them so the, the normal teachers can can get a break, so they're going to have fun today. But we got one more really important thing to do this morning. I need to ask our elders to come up. Gerald, if you come up. Billy and Kim, Donna, if you come up. Come up on stage, please. I have an announcement to make. I'm going to wait till they get up here. The last one up here has to give 50% of their salary to their church. Notice Billy's coming up last, y'all. Can you get blood out of a tournament, turnip, can you? Right? All right, we are blessed this morning to welcome two more official members to Living Word Church. And I want to say something. You don't have to join the church. You can serve in almost any area in the church without becoming an official member. Uh, but if you feel like God has planted you here, it's important to just make that claim that, that God sent me here, God planted me here, I want him to use me here. So we're blessed to have Roland and Melody Suttles Join us this morning. If you guys will come up, we're going to pray for them. Up the middle aisle, too. It's almost like you're getting married again. Yeah. We're gathered here today. <laughs> Y'all turn around so everybody can see how beautiful you guys are. You too, Roland. Uh, Listen, God is adding some real quality assets to this church, man. It's awesome. And this is two couples that have a lot of experience in ministry. God is going to use you guys. Cannot wait to see what God's going to do with you guys. We want to pray for you this morning. If y'all would pray with us this morning as well. Lord, we thank you for Roland and for Melody. Uh, Lord, first of all, that they are your children. They are uh, covered by your blood. They are saved, uh, forgiven, Lord, redeemed and set free. And God, and they are... They are on fire for you, Lord. You have used them in the past, Lord. But, Lord, we believe, and we're going we're gonna to ask today, that what they've done in the past for you, Lord, would pale in comparison to what you're going to do with them in the future, Lord. We know, Father, that you are not done. You have a great and mighty purpose for Roland and Melody in your kingdom. And so, Father, we are blessed that they are part of our family. And, Lord, we can't wait to see what you're going to do, how you're going to use them. Lord, I ask you to bless them in every way possible. Lord, in their family, with their children, grandchildren. God, in their business, their jobs. Lord, in their life, their marriage together. And, Lord, in their ministry here in the church and outside of the church. Lord, would you give them fruit for their labor. And I know that they will give you the praise and honor and glory because you are the one that's due and worthy of it. But, Lord, we ask you to bless them and thank you for them. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand. We love you guys. What a blessing. What a blessing. Awesome. They, they kind of sit quiet, but I'm telling you, these are heavyweights, man. They have, they have uh, just a wealth of knowledge and experience in ministry. I cannot wait to see how God's going to use you guys. I hope that you guys will, will give them a hand and a hug before they leave today and thank them for being part of our church. Wow, it's already been an awesome day. It's already been an awesome day. 
Last week we started a series on the Holy Spirit, and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to last, I know, throughout June. I would ask you to do me a favor. I know it's Memorial Day weekend. There are probably people that are, uh, some are recovering from graduation. Um, some are, are probably taking the weekend off, and nothing wrong with that at all. But I would ask you for the next few weeks throughout this series to try your best to be here because I believe that God wants to do a mighty work in this church. And, and I know you can watch online, and, I, and I'm not saying you have to be here, but I'm telling you, when we come and we gather together, it's something special. It's just different when we're together, and I believe that God wants to do something awesome. Today is Pentecost Sunday, so happy Pentecost Sunday. I want to ask you to not rely on your tradition, but be willing to learn something or maybe be open to what God may want to teach all of us today. Um, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, but I, before we get there, I want to say something. Uh, the Apostle Paul, throughout Scripture, there's three specific times where the Apostle Paul tells us, don't be ignorant. Um, in, in our language, we would say, don't be stupid, okay? Don't be ignorant. And, and the first one is uh, regarding Israel, their history and, and place in prophecy. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25 it says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Uh, the second place where Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, is, is regarding the end times. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. And the third place is where we are. What we're talking about is the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. So these three places, and I understand why, because when you talk about any of these three topics, it stirs up controversy. Everybody has an opinion, and these are matters that often, I've seen it, and you have too probably, in the church, people will be so dogmatic about their point and that they want to prove themselves right and you wrong, that we can honestly have some real arguments about these things. But I want to remind you that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, he says this, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Peace. Why does he say that? Because he knows. We, we, it won't come natural for us to just have unity. We have to work at it. Um, some of the other translations... Uh, it says, he said, make every effort here, but others say to endeavor to keep unity. Uh, be diligent in keeping unity. Why is that? Because it just doesn't come natural. Um, so I, I want to say this about what we're talking about as far as the Holy Spirit and these other topics. Um, we can discuss, we can gently debate, but we should never divide. Discuss, gently debate, but never divide ever divide on these things they're non-salvation issues in my opinion um, one of the things that that as i get older i've learned uh, don't argue about the stuff that doesn't really change eternity um, and and not everybody agrees with that and some people would say well no it does affect eternity and so there we go we can argue about that but i don't think we should and we should never divide and i've known people even in this church that would so differ with our opinion and our position on the scripture that they would just leave the church we've had people just leave the church over uh, spiritual gifts and how they manifest and operate and, and end times and all those things. So we just don't want to do that. In Acts chapter 1, after Jesus was res resurrected, uh, verse 4 says this, On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Pay attention to that word. If you're a note taker, I'm going to ask you to either underline or highlight some things. So, so you can underline that one. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So there's 120 gathered in this upper room, and Jesus is fixing to go back, and he says, just wait. I want you to hang out and wait. Uh, another interesting thing in this set of verses, it's the last place that we see the mention of uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, verse 14 says that they were all there joining constantly together in prayer along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brother. So... There's some detail here. Um, so they're waiting, and like many of us, when we have to wait, we get what? Impatient. We don't like waiting. 
We live in a world where we don't even have to wait. I heard a, a report the other day about McDonald's, and there was people complaining about how slow McDonald's was and that their goal was to get their food to you from the time you ordered to the time you got your food less than 60 seconds. And there were some McDonald's that were taken between two and three minutes from the time you ordered to get their food, and people were complaining. Think about that. You order it, and in three minutes, I've waited too long. Three minutes is too long to get my hamburger, right, or whatever. And that's true. That's just the world that we live in. So while they're waiting in this upper room, Peter decides to do something while they're waiting. He says, okay, let's, while we're waiting, let's get busy and do something, right? Did y'all catch that? That's us, right? So they do something that I don't believe is directed by God. I'll tell you why in a minute. And they decide they need to replace Judas. And so they pick two guys, uh, Joseph and Matthias. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 26, it says they cast lots. If you don't know what that is, it's basically like rolling the dice or flipping a coin. And, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the 11 apostles. The reason I don't think this is directed by God is because we never, ever hear anything else about Matthias. Nothing. I mean, not even being martyred for his faith. He wasn't, you know, I mean, nothing. We, he just, this is the first and not last time we hear anything about him. I mean, you would think that something, he would do something worthy of being mentioned in the scriptures. But, and quite honestly, I think we know who God's choice is. And we find it in Acts chapter 9 when Paul is chosen by Jesus to be an apostle. And he says, uh, Paul says, I am chosen as one abnormally born, he would write later, but chosen by, by God. The other thing, I, the other reason I think it's not directed by God, this is the last time we see anything about uh, casting lots in the Bible. And why is that? Because when God gives you his Holy Spirit, he will guide you. He will direct you. He will speak to you. He will tell you what to do. You don't need to be flipping coins. If you're a coin-flipping Christian, stop it. You know, it's like, should we sell our house or not? You know, should we get another job? Just stop doing that. Pray. You know, get on your face before God. Fast if you have to. Um, but just stop flipping coins, okay? So Pentecost. So Pentecost is 50 days um, after Jesus was resurrected. Uh, how many of you know how many days Jesus walked around on the earth after he was resurrected? 40 days, right? So how many days did they have to wait? 10 days. Thank you. Great. Hey, you guys are smart. You knew that because you were in school when they were actually teething, teaching arithmetic. I, I don't know what they're doing these days, y'all. They're just like teaching pronouns or something. I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Uh, but anyway, so 10 days. So Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound, highlight that or underline it, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw, mark that down, write it down or highlight it or something. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. That's the next word. Uh, highlight, write it down or circle it or something. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Verse 5 says, Now there were is staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. You know, if you can't explain it, just blame it on the alcohol, right? But there are three phenomena going on right here that, that I want to kind of talk about today. The first one is an audible phenomenon. It was a sound. The second is a visible. They saw something. They saw these tongues of fire. The third is verbal, where they were speaking in unknown or known languages to those that they were speaking to, but they were unknown to those that were speaking them. So why Pentecost? Well, the short answer is God has been unveiling his plans throughout history to the world 
through the ancient Jewish feast. Let's look at Jesus. The parallels to Jesus and, and the Spirit being poured out to the Old Testament is just uh, amazing when you really look at it. Jesus was crucified. He died on Passover, one of the feasts that we remember talked about uh, in Moses' day. That at the same time, lambs were being sacrificed in the temple. Jesus was being sacrificed as the Lamb of, the God, Lamb of God who gave his life to save the world from his sins at the same time on the same day. Three days later, he rises from the dead on another feast, the Feast of First Fruits. This is, this is the time where Jews would present the first part of their harvest to the temple just basically to thank God. And at the same time, Jesus rises on this feast to show them that, listen, I am the first of many who will rise from the dead and give glory to God and, and, and with a glorified body. And then 50 days, the, the next feast is the Feast of Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost as we know it. This is where God poured out His Spirit in Acts chapter 2. So the word Pentecost just simply means 50 or 50th. So there are two reasons, I believe, why God chose Pentecost. The first is a historical reason where God wanted to commemorate the giving of, a law, of giving of the law on Mount Sinai. You remember the story where Moses went up on the mountain and God gave him the law, specifically the Ten Commandments. And at the same time, while Moses was up on the mountain and the rest of the Jews were at the bottom of the mountain waiting, pay attention to that, waiting for Moses to come back down with the law, something tragic happened. They got tired of waiting, and they said, we don't even know if this guy's coming back, and we need some gods to worship. It just shows our need to worship, our intrinsic need to worship something. And so they went to Aaron, and he said, all right, give me some of your gold. And, and what he did was he throws it in the fire, and he makes this gold, he fashions it, molds it into some calves, and they begin to worship these calves. I think it's interesting in, in verse number 7, uh, 32, 7, it says, God tells Moses, go down because your people have become corrupt. Now, you notice the language there? God says, your people. He doesn't say my people. He says, your people have become corrupt. Think about this, Dad. When you come home and Mom says, your son or your daughter is driving me crazy. At that moment... I don't want nothing to do with them, right? That's kind of the thought in my mind that God's going, I'm so tired of these people, I'm going to wipe them out. And he tells Moses that. He says, I'm going to wipe them all out, and I'll turn you into a great nation. I'm just, just go down there because I'm, just, I'm done with these, your people. I think it's really funny the way it happens. So Moses goes down, and what he finds is that they're just running around crazy. The, the scripture says that they are... Uh, are worshiping these calves and engaging in revelry. Some, some translations, the King James says they rose up to play, but that doesn't mean playing games. That literally means to engage in sexual immorality. They were just doing all kinds of crazy things. And so the Lord tells Moses to do this. He says, call to the people, and he says, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And the scripture tells us that the Levites came to Moses, and here's what God told them to do for judgment against those who were, had turned against God. In verse 30, uh, 27 of, verse, of chapter 32, it says this, He said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Now, we look at this and we go, that, That's so different than Jesus, right? It's not. God is a God of judgment. And the day is going to come when God is going to judge all of us according to our actions, according to our deeds, whether we were obedient to him or rebellious to him. And on that day, 3,000 people died. On the same day, Pentecost, the Feast of Shavuot, Peter preaches a sermon. Peter, a man who failed God, denied Jesus. After the Holy Spirit fell, God used Peter to preach a sermon. In verse 38, it says this, that Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 31 tells us that after that sermon, 
that, that 3,000 people were saved. He told them to separate yourselves from this corrupt generation. 3,000 were saved. Listen, the Old Testament Pentecost gave us the law. The New Testament Pentecost gave us, uh, gives us life. The Old Testament Pentecost, 3,000 people died. The New Testament Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved and lived. The parallels are amazing. That's why we have to understand in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, Paul wrote this, there's a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The law was never intended to save us. The law was only intended to expose our sin and show us the need for a Savior. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says that I have come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. John 3, 16 says that Jesus came so that none would perish but have everlasting life. Life is found in the Spirit through Jesus Christ, not the law. And God chose Pentecost, why? To help us to understand that the law kills, but the Spirit gives life. Isn't that good news? So the second reason I believe that God chose Pentecost is because of the feast. On this feast, they would bring two loaves of wheat baked with yeast. This is the only feast where yeast is actually used because yeast was a symbol of sin. And even in Passover, remember, he told them to make bread without yeast, without sin. Jesus is the one without sin. So why did God tell him to do it on this day? Because he was the Lord of the harvest, and he accepted yeast on this one feast. Why? Because God accepts sinners like you and me with yeast, with sin in us, on this same day of, of Pentecost, that God would accept them as sinners, not because of their sin, because of their repentance, because of their turning to Jesus on this feast. And just like us, they are accepted because of their repentance and welcomed as part of the harvest. We know that the scripture tells us the fields are white to the harvest. That God would send out workers, that the workers are few, but the harvest is plentiful. God wants to use people like you and me today to tell people about Jesus because there's a harvest out there that God is just waiting to reap if we will just get on board with him. That we're to go out into the world telling people about Jesus. So let's go back to the three phenomenon. The first one is sound. It's like a wind. It says wind is the symbol of the presence of God, wind or spirit. In the Old Testament, the word is ruach. In the New Testament, the word is pneuma. Uh, it's the Greek word, and we know this. When you have a disease of your breath, it's pneumonia, right? You can't breathe. A pneumatic tools for the guys, you know, and it's like we understand that. It's about wind. It's about breath. It's the presence of God. The scripture tells us that God took Elijah up in a whirlwind and that God spoke to Job in a whirlwind. Jeremiah 30, 23 says, Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goes forth with fury. Jesus having a conversation with Nicodemus, Nicodemus in chapter uh, 3 of John, verse 8 says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The second phenomenon is visible. They saw, Acts chapter 2, verse 3 says, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So fire is another symbol of the presence of God, the purifying presence of God. Now this was not a fire, uh, the tongues of fire that, that lighted on them, that uh, set on them. It wasn't a burning fire. Think about the uh, Exodus 3 where Moses saw uh, God in the symbol of a burning bush, a bush that was on fire but didn't, was not consumed by the fire. Exodus 13, where they were protected by a pillar of fire, the presence of God. Exodus 19 says that God descended on the mountain with fire when he was giving the law. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, it says that John baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire, the presence of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 says that God is a consuming fire. So these symbols of wind, of fire, of the presence of God, and then Acts chapter 2, the third one, the verbal. It says that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, what in the world is this all about? Oh, would you look at that? We're out of time. So that's a little teaser, guys, for next week. Next week, we're going to devote the whole study to tongues and I want to encourage you to come don't be afraid 
It's God's presence. I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that uh, just the way there's, there are no coincidences in your, God, in your word, God. There's, there's, no, there's no thing that contradicts each other, Lord. The Old Testament, the law, so it works so well with the New Covenant and the New Testament, God. And even today, we can see how, God, you are always working, just like we even sang in the song. God, you're always working and trying to draw us to, each, to you, God. And, and we just worship you this morning. I thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we still have the, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, that we can look and see. Even there, God, there is your grace. While you could have wiped out the entire generation, Lord, you chose to give grace. Yes, there was judgment, but God, you still gave grace. Even when you desired and your plan was to wipe them all out, Lord. So God, I pray that today we would receive your Holy Spirit. That we would be like those early disciples, just waiting, not, not tired, not distracted, not impatient, but God, waiting on you to do something amazing. Lord, we're ready. We're ready. We're ready to see you pour out your spirit in this church, in our lives, in our families, on our jobs. Lord, what seems impossible, could you pour out your spirit in our government? Could you pour out your spirit in a way that leaders of our nation, our state, our county, our city, our world, our country are changed by your spirit? Oh, God, that you would pour out your spirit in this country and that people would turn to you. Because, Lord, we do believe that even as you left, as the word says, you will come back in like manner. You will come back. And Lord, we believe that coming is soon. Lord, we know that when you come back, that when your feet hit that mountain, that it's going to split in two. It's going to shake the world. And for many, it's going to be too late. So Lord, I pray that we would be the kind of people today that desire you, that have a devotion to you, Lord, that there's nothing that would stop us from pursuing you. There's not a sickness. There's not fatigue. There's not a distraction. There's not persecution or apathy or anything that would stop us from pursuing you with zeal, with passion, with all that we have. Because you have all the answers, God. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need you to fill us. We need you to drive out the evil and, and to replace it with the goodness of God and with desire to know and love him, to serve him. And Lord, we pray today that you would do that for us, not so that we can brag and say we have something somebody else doesn't have. No, God, that we could have love and compassion for a world that needs you just as bad as we do. Give us boldness today, Lord. Even though it's a holiday weekend, Lord, you're not taking off. You're still at work. So use us, Father, even today as we go to restaurants and and even home and different places to stores or whatever as we spend time with friends let us know lord that you are there with us and you always will be you love us you haven't turned away from us and you're not done you're just getting started can't wait to see what you're going to do next in this church lord and in our community that people would be turned to you that they would be saved and forgiven and redeemed and that a true a true revival would start not a not a marquee revival, God, but a true revival of your spirit and your church, that we would be set on fire for you, Lord, that we would have boldness and courage like never before, that we wouldn't care what anybody thinks, that we would not be ashamed of the gospel, knowing that it is life and all that we need. Help us, God. We need you. Lord, as you send us out today, let us have mouths that speak how awesome you are, Jesus. And we'll give you praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Love you guys.